turn your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 25, 24 actually, 24. I'm going to get ahead of myself here. Verses 36 through 51. Chapter 24, verses 36 through 51. And we've entitled our thing, uh, Yes, Children Can Meet Over Here as Children's Church uh, with Pastor Lonnie. Um, and so if you're interested in that, please, you're meeting right over here at this moment. If you follow along with me in your copy of God's Word, we're going to talk about living in the last days. Living in the last days. Verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding in the, at the mill, and one will be taken, and one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know what day the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour which you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give him their food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all of his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to him, my master is delayed, and he begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drinks with drunkards, the master of the servant will come on that day, and when he does, do not, uh, when he does not expect him, and at an hour which does not, he does not know, and will cut him into pieces and put him with the hypocrites in that place that will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Heavenly Father, I do bow before you and ask that your hand of great mercy be upon us because we deserve the wrath that you would extend to all peoples because of our sin. Lord, help us to understand that apart from the grace and mercy of you that we are in dire straits. That, Father, we stand before the aggravated, aggravated judgment of your holiness and justice. And so, Lord, today I pray that if there are people here that uh, have never understood that we stand guilty before you, that we stand as sinners before a holy God, that you would change that in our own life, in our own heart, that we would call upon your name, that we would run to you, the God not only of justice but of mercy. And Father, we would find mercy at a time that we need it. And I pray, Father, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 24 and 25 are what we call Jesus' Olivet Discourse. It is his sermon many times of what was going to happen in the future. And some of the things, as we said last week, were a future for them but were history for us. But some of the things in these passages are future, what are going to happen in the future. Now I can tell you, as I said before, there are books written about the end times, the last days. You could probably find books galore about the last days. One of the famous ones recently, or in the last decade or two decades, was a book by the name of Left Behind. It was a series of books uh, that was talking about what was going to happen in the future. Now, uh, I don't agree with the, the conclusions written in those books because it is a story. It was a story. It was a, a captivating story because we're all wanting to know what's going to happen in the future, don't we? We, know, we want to know what God is going to do in the future. We all want to know that. And the people at that time when Jesus died or was going to die as a sacrifice for us for our sins, they wanted to know what was going to happen about the kingdom. In fact, I believe that the whole of his sermon was summarized pretty much in 
uh, when the, the disciples asked him of these three questions found in verse 3. In chapter 24, verse 3, they said to Jesus, tell us when these things will be. Now, in other words, the tumbling of the Temple Mount, the tumbling of Jerusalem. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the close of the age? So he's asking and answering, Jesus really is, in this message, those three things. We said last week that the tumbling or the destruction of the Jerusalem temple was going to happen and did happen in A.D. 70. That that was prophesied in these passages here. That A.D. 70 was a time when the, the Roman rulers of that day came in and Felix, I believe it was, came in and destroyed the temple, completely wiped it out. And the prophecy of Matthew chapter 24 was fulfilled. Then it comes down and we see here some other words about the future, about things that were going to go on in the future. Now, works of fiction are just that, works of fiction. But man, they, they grip us so well. Left behind, I, at the last count I know, sell more than 65 million copies. Think about that, 65 million copies. P people want to know, What's going to happen to them in the future? I remember sermons when I first became a, uh, a believer in Christ. One of the sermons I remember hearing was that the, 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 the uh, second coming of Jesus Christ was going to happen within the next month or two. I remember hearing that. And I was going, wow, man, I don't even have to study for tests anymore. That was pretty good. You know, that was going to really happen. And it was so convincing. I remember there, there was a big thing, this is after I became a Christian, but it seems like we, we kind of date things. We, there, was, there was a movement that says Jesus was coming back in 1981. And you know where they get that. They, they, they extrapolate from 1948 when Israel became a, a nation and they said, okay, well, what, what is a generation? And then they subtracted seven years from that and they came up with 1981. Then people, as I said last week, they came up with other, other things. But what is the last generation? Because I believe when Jesus said that the generation, it said here, the generation, I say to you in verse 34, this generation will not pass away. It's not on a slide. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. I believe he was talking about the generation that was alive during the time of Christ. I do believe that. But then he goes on in verse 36, he says, but... But concerning the day and hour, which he's now going to talk about the second coming of the Lord, when Jesus will come back, when Jesus does that. Now, I guarantee you, when you read about prophecy, there is so much out there that I usually believe that the person who reads about prophecy a lot, they start changing depending on the last book they read. Because it all sounds so convincing when you actually read a book about it. But one of the things you have to understand is that we misinterpret things all the time. We think that this means this or this means that because prophecy is highly symbolic, isn't it? The, the literature, especially the book of Revelation, is highly apostolic or uh, not apostolic, but um, apocalyptic, meaning it, they, they use symbols to represent other things. And our problem is we don't know what those symbols mean half the time. We look at the book of Revelation, we look at other books like uh, Elijah or uh, Elisha and, or the, their, their ministry or uh, um, Ezekiel, and we think, what in the world is a wheel within a wheel? What is that? You know, I often say that when, you, when God inspired writers to write about things they couldn't understand because they couldn't understand some of this stuff, God had to give them some sort of concrete vision in their mind. I often say this all the time. If you were in 1930, you were living in 1930, and God wanted to give you a revelation of an iPod or a cell phone, what would he have to do? There was nothing out there like that, was there? He would have to say something like a recordless record player. And that would probably mean nothing to them, but it means something to us today, living after the fact of the invention of the iPod. So, that, so, that, so, so people love to debate these things. They love to get into it. And congregation and congregation love to debate when is Jesus going to come. Now, 
I'll tell you this. I have my opinions, and they are just that, opinions. How strongly am I on those opinions? I'll argue with you my opinions, but my confidence that I'm always right is probably around a three on a scale of one to 10. You, you cannot give your complete entire life to something that you're not absolutely sure about. I will give my life for the cause of the gospel. I will give my life for the cause of Jesus Christ. I will give my life to declare to you that Jesus Christ ultimately is God's holy son. He is God incarnate. But the second coming of Christ, Jesus talked about it. Paul talked about it. John talked about it. And it is an important subject in the Bible. 30% of all the Bible is written about the end time, the last days. The question is, what are the last days? Are the last days going to be sometime in the future where, 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 we, we, where it's, it's a period of time? Or is the last days the period between when Jesus went up to heaven in his ascension and when he comes back down? I think the Bible normally is very clear that the last days are between his first coming and second coming. I believe that we are living in those last days. I believe that. I believe we are living in those last days, but what do we do about it? What do we do and what should we do about it if we're living in those last days? You see, the Bible says the last days in a number of different ways. Sometimes the last days, because words don't mean the same thing all the time, do they? I mean, words change the meaning. You know, if I said to you, um, the, just the word trunk, trunk, what does that mean? Well, it could mean a lot of things, couldn't it? It could be a trunk of a tree. If I could tell you to hit the trunk, it could be the trunk of a tree, trunk of a car, the trunk of an elephant. Don't hit a trunk of an elephant. It could be one of those, remember they used to have what they called steamer trunks, right? Trunk of your body. There's all sorts of ways because words are based upon the context of what you're looking at. And in this context, Jesus is telling them about what is immediately going to happen through the fall of Jerusalem, through the destruction of the temple. And then he's saying to the disciples, listen, this isn't always the way it's going to be. Your life is not just going to be here on earth. The majority of God's plan is going to be also for what you will experience in the glorious riches of heaven. And heaven needs to be upon your mind just as much as the earth is on your mind today. Jesus said, or it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, when Luke writes this, he says, In the last days, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on what? All flesh. And your son and daughter shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. You see, Paul this, this prophecy was fulfilled at the coming of Christ. This prophecy was fulfilled when God inspired people to write down the very words of those visions and dreams into what we call the Bible today. The most authoritative book in the world is the Bible. The most authoritative statements in the world is the Bible. The most dynamic word that we can ever have for our life is found in the revelation of God through the scriptures that were the fulfillment of men and women and boys and girls receiving revelation from God through the Spirit of God. Peter quoted the Old Testament a lot through the prophet Joel in this passage. And he says, this is the final age he was talking about. The days that we're living in. It is the New Testament time that is the final age of life. You see, the New Testament it was far better than the Old Testament. The Old Testament, uh, they, prophecy and vision and dreams were mostly given to kings and to prophets. But today, we have access to those vision and dreams, ultimately, not only through our own personal relationship with God, but through the scriptures that have been codified for us in the 66 books of the Bible. Those are the revisions and dreams that were written down 
ultimately as the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. In other places in the scriptures we see in the New Testament is such a great place to be in the years, the last days. Because we experience God's grace as we've never experienced it before. You see, in the last days, there are a couple things I want you to know. Number one this morning is this. In the last days, I want you to understand that as long as we live in the last days, no one knows when the end will come. I think he's very clear about this in verse 36. He says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Anytime you get into chronology in the Bible, anytime you're trying to figure out the exact date when it's going to happen, run the other direction because it's going to be wrong. Because no one knows the date and hour. He illustrates this by the idea that people were eating and drinking and marrying. And they were just going about life as normal. And all of a sudden, the ark showed up. All of a sudden, Noah came in and, and, and the flood swept them away. And they didn't even know that the flood was coming. You see, the same way it's going to be when the Son of Man comes, when Jesus comes back. And when we, He comes back, we're going to have to stand before Jesus. He is going to judge us, and He's going to judge the wicked and the dead. He will judge us according to His standard of righteousness. He will judge us. He will judge the world. He will judge everyone living and dead. No one will get away for their wickedness in this life. No, not politicians either. No one will get away with their wickedness and their rebellion against the Almighty God. So in the last days, no one knows the day. But he says to us, in light of this, be diligent. Pursue the Lord God with all your heart. It says in Matthew, that's what it says in Matthew 24, 36. Nobody knows. The angels don't know. Jesus doesn't know. The only one who knows is the one who planned it all, the Father God, from whom all things come from. And Jesus didn't know why he was here on earth. Now, in heaven he knows, but on earth he didn't. He didn't know because his humanity was, was you know, he had to learn things as he grew up. And so while Jesus was on earth, it's not a denial of the omniscience of God or the omniscience of Jesus to say that Jesus didn't know something while he was here on earth. There are times you see in the Bible where he knew what was in men's heart. He had omniscience, but he veiled that omniscience. He veiled that all-knowing attribute of himself so that he could come and be like us. Because one of the things that he needed to do is to be like us so he could die for us because of our sin. Do you get that? Do you understand that? The second coming points us not to chronological ideas, but to the idea that we should be diligent. We should be diligent and to live our life for the King of Kings. I said last week in 1987, about three years after I became a Christian, I was given a book called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Must Take Place in 88. And I said, the author wrote that he could, well, he couldn't name the minute, he could name the day and the morning or the evening. And so he came up with September 16th in the morning of 1988. And this didn't come to pass. And you know what people do when their prophecies don't come to pass? They invent another one. Jehovah's Witness are famous for doing this. Five times... They have predicted the end of the world, and they were wrong every single time. You know when a Jehovah's Witness shows up at my door, you know what I ask him? Why were you wrong in predicting the end of the world five times? And then they go, well, we want to talk to you about this. I go, no, no, no. You need to explain why you were wrong five times. Because if you can't explain that to me, you have to realize that you are false prophets. Jehovah's Witness do not believe in the deity and the personhood of Jesus Christ. They believe that they have a way with their own translation of the Bible that they can be more, more, um, how would I say, more committed to God than we are as believers in Christ. 
But they don't have a God of grace. They don't have the God of mercy that we do. They don't have a Savior that was sinless and died. You see, Jesus said plainly, no one knows the day or hour. You see, the second book called 89 Reasons Why Jesus Didn't we should come in 89, didn't sell as well. <laughs> you know, it just, people got caught on. It didn't sell as well. So after that, they stopped. But I think we all realize that when it calls a day and an hour, it really means that no one knows. And the question I think we need to understand today is that why are there so many prophecies in the Bible? What are they there for? If we don't know exactly when Jesus is coming back so we can plan, there are a couple reasons. Number one, it helps us recognize the precision of God's plan. God has a plan for all of history. All of history is God's. He holds, as the song says, the whole world in his hand. There is nothing that our God cannot do. There is nothing that he cannot overcome. The Bible is clear that no one, it says, can thwart the plans of God. So God has a precision in his plan. He is looking to bring about the end and the consummation of his kingdom to this world. You know, when we talk about the new heavens, this is not in the text, but the new heavens and new earth. It, it, it is, we're going to be living on a new heaven and new earth. We're going to have a physical and bodily existence. There's going to be food in heaven. Did you know that? There's going to be an earthly existence. Some people would say chocolate, right? In heaven. Sounds good to you. So some people would say that there's going to be chicken fried steak in heaven. No, there's going to be food. Chick-fil-A in heaven. Okay. Uh, we'll, 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 take, we'll take nominations. What do we want in heaven as far as food? We will have physical bodies. Now, I have no idea what they're going to be like. I, I have this idea that we're going to be able to walk through walls and things of that nature like Jesus did, but I have no idea really. I, I do know that my body, when I get to heaven, will be indestructible. It will have no sickness. It will be able to run the 100-yard dash in two seconds. I'm thinking. I'll be able to hit a baseball over the center field fence every single time. My eyes will be 20-20. Everything will be great, but I do not know the time when that will happen, but God does. Amen. And if God does, rest assured, your life is good. Number two, if no one knows the day and hour, God wants us to know that we need to know his purpose. His purpose in that situation. There's not just an earthly purpose, there's a heavenly purpose that God has. God has a heavenly purpose, he has an earthly purpose, and his heavenly purpose ultimately is to usher in the uh, consummation, the end, the fullness of the kingdom. Right now we are living in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has already come. Jesus is reigning, but he's reigning today from heaven. And one day he will come and he will reign from earth for all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. That is the new existence that we have. And so that's the first thing. No one knows the day or the hour. Secondly, in the last days, we must be ready. Be ready at all times. This was true in the first century when Jesus was there. Every generation believes that Jesus is coming back when? In their lifetime, don't they? Now, if Jesus could come back tomorrow, that would be great. But if he waits another thousand years, we need to be ready for his coming. Amen. We need to do that. There's an old joke. It goes like this. A guy calls his insurance agent, and he says, can I get some fire insurance? The agent says, I'll have to inspect your house first. The man says, well, uh, then you better hurry because it's engulfed in flames right now. <laughs> Now, insurance usually doesn't work that way. You know, we have to get it before the event happens. And for obvious reason, though, though uh, neither, is, neither is obedience to Christ something we can wait until the last minute. You don't need to wait until the last minute. You need to be ready today, right now, 
this time because it said in verse 40, two men will be in the field, but one will be taken and one will be left. In verse 42, it goes on and talks about this when he says this. In verse 42, it says, therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day the Lord is coming, but know this. If the master of the house had known what part of the night the thief was coming, he would stay awake and he would have not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour which you do not expect. If I knew when someone was going to break into my house, you know what? I would be ready. I'd go out by a gun. I'd be at the door. I'd be ready to go. Right? Well, maybe in Texas you can do that. I don't know in Maryland. But, but, but I'd be ready, wouldn't you? I mean, you, you, you would be ready. If you knew exactly when a thief was coming to come into your house, you'd be ready, and you would nail him to the wall, wouldn't you? Because you would be ready. That's what Jesus is saying. We don't know the hour. We don't know the time. But still, we've got to be ready. We don't wait to obey God four years from now. The Bible says very clearly, today is the day that you need to get right with God. Today is the day that you need to start walking with God. Today is the day that you need to come back to God. William Miller, a Baptist preacher in 1844, predicted the end of the world in 1845. This has been going on all the time. All the time. And, and what we need to realize is that Jesus puts this in the Bible so that we would be ready, that we know that there's an incoming, that this is not all there is. You know, there's an easy trap to fall into prophecy. You, you start looking for things to happen, and you start building a timeline, and you try to put all the pieces together, but you can't always figure it out. Because the Bible doesn't say that it's going to give you an actual timeline. The Bible does say that it's going to give you some signs and some issues that you're going to look at. I remember when I first became a Christian, Russia was the big country that was going to invade Israel. And maybe that's so. But maybe that's not. Because the Bible doesn't say Russia. It doesn't say that. It says other things. It uses symbolism and symbols to deal with that. So today we have to realize that we can be wrong when we think about the end times. We don't need to figure it all out. We have to figure out how we obey God now. We as a church don't need to figure out when, when, if Jesus is going to come back tomorrow or a thousand years. What we need to do is we need to obey God today, now, not tomorrow. We don't need to put off obeying God or repenting of our sins or receiving forgiveness. You don't need to put that off because Jesus here, he's saying, he always says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and your bur my burden is light. He calls us to himself, both effectually and generally. He calls us to himself. I just want you to look at one other thing today. Closing. It says in verse, if you read verses 45, 46 through pretty much to the end of the chapter, it talks about a faithful and wicked servant. And he uses this illustration to say that, you know what? In those last days, you've got to be faithful. This would be my third point. I didn't have a third point for a slide, but this would be my third point. Because you've got to have three points, right? So you need to be ready. And you, need to be, you need to be humble. You need to be, you need to be faithful. Because the faithful servant and wise servant, when the master leaves him in charge of everything, what does he do? He does what the master wills. The unwise or the foolish or the wicked servant, what does he do? When the master leaves, he does what? It's, look at what it says. In verse 45, it says, Who then is faithful and wise servant? Whom his master has sent over his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant from whom his master will find doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, 
He will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour which he does not know, and he will cut him into pieces and put him in, put him in with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, there's going to be time when you can be assured that judgment is coming. Jesus, God is going to make all things right. Every, every, everything that has been done against you, God is going to make right. Everything that you've done against somebody else, God is going to make right. The question is, are you going to pay for those wrongs that you've done, or is Jesus going to pay for them? If, if, if you try to work your way to heaven, if you try to be good enough to get into heaven, you know what's going to happen? You will be more like the wicked servant because you will fail. But if you're like the faithful servant who wants to do the Father's will, the Master's will, and he wants to do it even when the Master is not there watching him all the time, you know what? You will be blessed. And you know what that blessing is? It's a relationship with Jesus Christ that surpasses nothing else in this life. It is a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that is what we were created to be. In relationship with God. We were created to be in relationship with God. Yes, Jesus knows my name. Amen. Because of what Jesus did upon that cross. I know, I know without a doubt. I have no doubt that heaven is mine. I have no doubt that God is with me. And if that is something that you need to work on, or you've been away from God, you've been more like the wicked servant, God says, come to me. Come back to me. For the first time, for the twelfth time, for the thousandth time, you can always come back to me. Because you know what? My grace is sufficient. So see, today, when you look at prophecy, remember these two verses. Verse 36, concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels, nor the Son, but the Father only. And verse 44, therefore, you must be ready. When do you be ready? Today. Today. You need to be ready today. Let me ask you, are we living in the last days? My answer is yes. So don't put off being ready for the Lord. Heavenly Father, I bow before you today and I ask you to strengthen each one of us today. Father, if there are people that are here today that do not have that relationship, that dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ, with God the Father through Jesus Christ, that has been called by your spirit, I pray, Father, that you would work in their heart today, that you would draw them to yourself in an effectual and powerful way. For, Father, all of those things, the results are in your hand. But today, Father, I pray that you would give us strength and power. If there is someone in the sound of my voice that needs to join this body of believers, this place, it's not a place, it's a, it's a people to take the gospel message that we love and cherish so much around the world. I ask you today to come and join with us. Step out from where you are and walk forward and let me know that you are wanting to be part of this fellowship and minister in this fellowship to take the gospel to the ends of the world. If you're here today and you need to start your walk with Jesus Christ, God has been calling you for days or weeks or months. He's calling you to himself. He asked you to come. And you've been resisting. Maybe, maybe you're unsure about what to do. I want to talk with you. I want to build a relationship with you. I want you to come and declare, I don't know everything about this, but I do want to know that I am in relationship with Jesus Christ alone for sure. If that's your heart today, I want to ask you to step out and come forward. Maybe you need to be baptized as a, as a profession of that faith. I want you to come forward and let me know. 
of that decision in your heart, the decision that the Spirit of God has prompted and drawn you to. Father, I pray for every person here because every person makes decisions every Sunday. Every time we gather together, I want people to make a verdict in their heart how they will live this week for the Lord. And so, Lord, as we sing our song of invitation today, our song of commitment, I pray that you would, you would strengthen us with your powerful might. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand today.